è dedicato al principio di sovranità sulle risorse naturali. Il principio di sovranità sulle risorse naturali è uno stretto corollario del principio di autodeterminazione, deriva direttamente dal principio di autodeterminazione dei popoli, strettamente legato a questo, però ha diciamo così, un contenuto che nel diritto internazionale non è ancora veramente molto chiaro ed è oggetto di controversie. Questo un po' è già eh, apparso nella prima relazione, nelle, prime, nelle relazioni della prima sessione, perché avete visto già che c'è stato qualche approccio, per esempio di Stutzmann, su questo contenuto di questo principio, che lo ha definito in un certo modo, probabilmente invece altri, e mi riferisco a Corelli che parlerà in questa sessione, potrebbero definirlo con un contenuto diverso. Quindi c'è un'idea diversa in realtà sul contenuto di questo principio, bisogna dire che effettivamente sotto diversi profili la pratica internazionale non è di facile ricostruzione, non è di facile ricostruzione perché la pratica internazionale non è spessissima, non è numerosissima, non è copiosissima e perché ci sono degli andamenti della prassi che vanno in modi non sempre uniformi, non sempre uguali, per cui è difficile estrapolare dall'assetto della comunità internazionale in modo inequivoco una regola uniforme anche nei processi di decolonizzazione e anche diciamo così, nelle ultime decolonizzazioni che ci sono state, di cui la più vicina al caso dei Sarawi probabilmente è la mh, situazione che si è verificata a Timor-Est. Nel corso di questa sessione noi discuteremo del contenuto di questo principio perché è chiaro che se non abbiamo in mente che cosa questo principio vuole dire esattamente, che cosa comporta, è difficile anche pronunciarsi sul problema che la seconda sessione pone. Il problema che la seconda sessione pone è se gli accordi in materia di sfruttamento delle risorse che l'Unione Europea ha concluso con il Marocco siano o meno compatibili con il diritto internazionale. Questo è il problema, questi accordi sono già stati evocati nella prima sessione, sono diversi, il più importante è quello sulla pesca, ma ce ne sono anche altri che sono stati conclusi a partire dal partenariato che il Marocco ha concluso con l'Unione Europea, partenariato più generale che fa seguito al processo di Barcellona e in questo quadro sono stati conclusi altri accordi di eh, carattere commerciale tra le due parti, eh, per esempio altrettanto importante forse per i pomodori che arrivano da noi a basso prezzo può essere l'accordo commerciale sui prodotti agricoli. Ora per la verità nessuno di questi accordi eh, conclusi dall'Unione Europea con Marocco si preoccupa di fare un cenno alla questione del Sahara occidentale e non troviamo scritto niente in realtà in questi accordi di espressamente riferito a questo problema, a questa questione e questo è già un po' strano per la verità ed è un po' un sintomo anche se magari Stutzman non è d'accordo dell'ambiguità dell'Unione Europea su questa questione perché la questione del Stato occidentale è ben evidente, tutti la sanno, tutti la conoscono, non è che è poco conosciuta dal pubblico però non è una questione dimenticata, in realtà gli esperti di questa questione sanno che c'è, il Parlamento europeo si è discusso molto di questo e anche nel Consiglio e anche negli altri organismi e istituzioni europee di questa questione quando eh, il problema è stato affrontato. Però stranamente questi accordi glissano su questo problema, fanno come Ponzio Pilato e quindi non si sa bene in realtà che cosa effettivamente questi accordi comportino dal punto di vista della questione del Sahara occidentale, o meglio a questo, questo silenzio comincia o potrebbe essere un problema in sé che noi dobbiamo affrontare, però è un silenzio dicevo sintomatico perché la posizione dell'Unione Europea o quello che fa l'Unione Europea in altri casi è assolutamente diverso, prendiamo per esempio la posizione dell'Unione Europea negli accordi conclusi con Israele, espressamente gli accordi conclusi con Israele escludono il territorio occupato i palestinesi dal loro ambito di applicazione, questo può pur dire qualcosa, no? Ed è anche diverso da altri accordi che sono stati conclusi dal Marocco con altri potenti, per esempio mi riferisco all'accordo che il Marocco sempre in materia di libero commercio ha concluso con gli Stati Uniti, 
L'accordo concluso con gli Stati Uniti, su richiesta degli Stati Uniti, espressamente esclude dal proprio ambito di applicazione il Stato occidentale in ossequio al principio di autodeterminazione dei popoli e ai suoi corollari al diritto appunto del popolo al rispetto della sovranità sulle proprie risorse. Questi accordi invece non dicono nulla e al tempo stesso, come è già stato evocato, ma ci verrà ribadito, implicano uno sfruttamento di queste risorse, cioè i prodotti che vengono prodotti appunto nel stato occidentale arrivano da noi, sia che siano prodotti della pesca, sia che siano prodotti dell'agricoltura, sotto forma di prodotti marocchini, senza che il popolo sarawi sia mai stato coinvolto nella negoziazione di questi accordi in alcun modo, nonostante le richieste del popolo sarawi nel rispetto del principio di autodeterminazione. Allora, è questa una situazione per cui si possa dire che l'Unione Europea si sta comportando in modo conforme al diritto internazionale? O è invece questa una situazione in cui l'Unione Europea sta schivando un problema dedicato che lei ha al suo interno, pretendendo di agire in modo conforme al diritto internazionale, ma in realtà l'Unione Europea è la prima che non agisce in modo conforme al diritto internazionale? o in altre parole alla fin dei conti, noi dobbiamo ritenere che questi accordi siano validi e vadano bene così e le cose stiano così, o invece che questi accordi siano nulli e questo ci interroga anche a noi no? come cittadini europei, come consumatori, quando noi ci troviamo qui a consumare dei prodotti della pesca etichettati in Marocco ma magari vengono dal sale occidentale, o prodotti dell'agricoltura etichettati in Marocco, ma magari appunto vengono dal Stato occidentale. Questa questione, che è una questione molto complessa, noi oggi stamattina la affronteremo con diversi interventi. Il primo intervento che abbiamo pensato è quello di Eric Hagen, che prego di venire. Eric, would you like to come with your presentation? Thank you. Hagen eh, viene dalla Norvegia. Oslo, più o meno, you, you come from Norway, Oslo, e anche se viene da così lontano, però, maybe you have to see this, see this better for you, uh, e si interessa di questa questione da moltissimo tempo, uh, perché in Norvegia è stata fondata un'associazione, un organismo, un'organizzazione non governativa, che fa un lavoro importantissimo che si chiama Western Sahara Resource Watch voi potete eh, trovare questo sul link anche in internet e tutto il lavoro che fanno e il lavoro che fa questa associazione è quello di proprio analizzare lo sfruttamento delle risorse nel Sahara occidentale senza il coinvolgimento o nonostante la volontà, contro la volontà del popolo sarawi. E questo sfruttamento è molto intenso perché, come vedrete, ci sono molte risorse al di là dei pomodori e della pesca. E quindi io gli darò eh, subito la parola per fare questo quadro introduttivo alla sessione. Dopodiché avremo il professor Milano che invece ci darà il punto di vista su questi problemi del diritto internazionale con una dimensione, un approccio che immagino neutrale, essendo un professore dell'Accademia, in particolare un professore dell'Università di Verona, poi dopo invece avremo di nuovo il punto di vista dell'Unione Europea con Riccardo Passos e il punto di vista, diciamo così, non delle Nazioni Unite perché non ne fa più parte, ma comunque dell'angolo della visione delle Nazioni Unite di eh, Mr. Corel che appunto ha lavorato nel, sotto, nel um, servizio giuridico delle Nazioni Unite. Ma adesso iniziamo con uno sguardo sulla situazione dello sfruttamento delle risorse nel Sahara occidentale. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. I won't speak in English. I'm uh, sorry. You get what I'm saying, right? Excellent, good. Well, I'm, um, I'm the chair of this international association. We have activists, volunteers in some 40... 50 countries. Together we research and do campaigns in relation to the natural resources in Western Sahara. Which are the resources, which are the companies, which are the governments involved, which trade agreements are involved, and then we try to prevent the resources from being a complicating factor in the solving of this conflict. 
Uh, we have, uh, we're based in Brussels, we have a kind of small office in Brussels, and we have a voluntary board, so I'm part of that one. We, um, I'm trying to say two things today. First, I'll give a short introduction of the resources involved, just a status on where we are, where Morocco is. And then secondly, European Union. And I will particularly look at the fisheries agreement that in 2011 there was a vote in the European Parliament, and I'll briefly go through what happened up until then to just illustrate the political nature of the European Union involvement. The day when the European, I'm from Norway, as said, uh, the European Union won the Nobel Peace Prize. Many people were, there were divided opinions about that, so to say. For the Sahrawis that we are in contact with, we are in contact with Sahrawis in the uh, Moroccan controlled areas, the occupied areas, and in the refugee camps with Polisario. Among all Sahrawis, it came as a shock. They perceive the European Union as one of the biggest problems in the conflict. It's possible to say, argue, that the European Union chooses not to be seen as a political actor in this game, but the EU is. According to the Moroccan government, the EU is. And according to the Sahrawis, the European Union is. And I'm talking a bit now today on how the European Union also says that it is, most of all, a political agreement when we want to fish in West Sahara. Now, this statement is from 2013, the Moroccan Minister of Information. In uh, 2008, the Moroccan Fisheries Minister said, most of all, fisheries, the EU fisheries in West Sahara is not le l'aspect financier, the financial aspect is not necessarily the most important, the, le volet financier. It's the political aspect which is important for the, for the, uh, in, in the fisheries. This is from the fisheries minister. Imagine having any fisheries minister in the world stating fisheries is not about fish, it's about politics. Now this is from the fisheries minister, right? Okay, the most grave development today is the oil. Uh, this map shows an oil platform. The first oil drilling will take place in Western Sahara this month. Most probably by the end of December, the first oil platform, the first drilling will take place ever in Western Sahara history. It's an American and a Scottish company. The rig uh, is uh, it's the first assignment. And this rig is going to drill on the block of the company called Cosmos. The Moroccan government does not produce oil itself. Its main reason for its financial deficit is the energy imports. If Morocco finds oil in general, they will be very happy. If they find it in Morocco, in Western Sahara, it will really be a problem for the conflict. The map to the left shows before any license was issued. In 2001, October 2001, uh, Mr. Hans Corell will explain more about the legal opinion made by the Security Council that was done as a consequence of two blocks issued on the offshore. They're not, only one of them is kind of visible here. Uh, the two blocks which Corel will mention is one given to an American company here and to a French company there. Okay? The French pulled out, but the Americans were a different company. They stayed. So this is 2008 uh, with certain blocks onshore, mostly controlled by very minor and unimportant companies and the Moroccan government itself. By 2013, Total, had uh, the French company, which was uh, the subject to Hans Corel's opinion, had returned. The Americans are now going to drill right here. The seismic service, th th this map shows the, 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 this, the distribution of blocks. It's, this is not the only uh, uh, disturbing part. The other is what's happening on the blocks. And this area is maybe the place in Africa with most studies so far. So, uh, seismic studies. There's been seismic here, seismic studies here, and now, uh, last week, another round of seismic service was started on this block. Uh, this is Swiss, Swiss uh, UK company. So, the, uh, the drilling, now this is the, um, basically the whole territory, offshore and offshore, has been either given to oil companies, or uh, is the yellow are, uh, blocks presented to the industry. 
So what was a small thing before is now going to be a big part. The announcement of a finding will be presented before the Security Council will meet in April. So this will have an influence on the conflict. Now that was the oil. The phosphates is also important. We monitor, this is the world's longest conveyor belt. It transports phosphate rock in its raw form out to the ships. This is taken in the occupied territories. Here you see the vessels waiting in the background. They transport the phosphates out on the international market. We monitor every single vessel that visits Western Sahara. We find out how big they are, where they go, and what, how big volume goes to each port in the world. So that means we can map which are the importers. And then we contact the importers, and we contact the owners, and the trade unions, and the media. So we do campaigns in these 12 countries. The main importers are North America, some to Lithuania, uh, New Zealand, uh, Mexico is quite big. The value uh, is annually around $330 million. Morocco controls three quarters of the entire phosphorus reserve in the world. Phosphorus is used for fertilizers, food production. Without phosphorus, the world will collapse. But seriously, Morocco has, Morocco is the NATO of food. So to say, Morocco controls the industrial global food production, especially in the future. It will be more important in the future. The fishery sector is important for the for changing the dem demography on the ground. People in Western Sahara say they are unemployed. In 2010, a large part of the people of Western Sahara have a peaceful protest camp outside of the capital of Western Sahara. The police came in and then there were violence, people were killed. They are frustrated over the socio-economic situation in addition to the self-termination process. And that happens while there are so many natural resources in terms of fish. So much employment in West Sahara. These are people moving into the territory. Some people get licenses on small scale fishing vessels. Others on larger scale fishing vessels. They fish around, they're mostly from Northern Europe, with Moroccan flags in the top. And they troll. There are about 25 of these industrial trawlers. We also monitor the um, uh, environmental management of these trawlers. Um, this vessel dumped 1,000 tons of sardines last year. The Saharawis in the refugee camps get one can of sardine every month. While they see their sardines are either exported to Europe... I mean, European Union gives 10 million euros a year in financial aid through ECHO. 10 million. At the same time, we pay, the European Union pays 3.6 times as much, or four, 4 times as much, to the Moroccan government to take the same bloody fish that they are receiving in cans made in China. It's, 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 uh, I mean, we're a civil society, we're supposed to be angry. This is uh, fish oil, about 20 million euros a year is transported in tank vessels uh, to France, mostly France, but also other countries in Europe. Just as so, the, the uh, Moroccan government refused in 2012 in the UPR process in the United Nations. They say a very clear, short answer. The question is, Will Morocco allow international the international minimum standards of registration of civil society organizations, including for those groups who want self-determination? The question is one word, no, the answer is one word, and that is no. Morocco does not follow international standards for registration of civil society groups. Demonstrations are not allowed, organizations are not allowed, trade unions are not allowed if they have the self-determination aspect in it. Anything we see as normal Infrastructure, politically, is not allowed if self-determination is, is part of that aspect of, of, of that agenda, okay? Alouat, he's the director of a handicap center. He goes down, he's a one-man demonstration, goes down with two posters, Cosmos Energy, do not drill for oil in Western Sahara. Police comes, stops him, and cuts him with a razor blade, right? One man demonstration. You can't have demonstrations with more people, so you have to have demonstrations with one person. Kamikaze demonstrations. It's, 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 uh, it's nonsense. Okay, now over to the European Union. People are frustrated in Western Sahara. People were... People, my friends on Facebook had a, had a black, you know, the profile page. It's a day in the European Union won the Nobel Peace Prize. They don't understand anything. Okay? I'm going back to the beginning. 1976. Um, Spain allows... Spanish Sahara to be annexed by Mauritania and Morocco. As part of that package, 
Spanish fishing fleet kept their traditional fishing rights in an agreement with the Moroccan government. Okay? The occupation of Sahara must be understood as a part of a dirty package where the Spanish regime, Franco regime, collapsing Franco regime, allowed Western Sahara to be occupied. So Spain kept that dirty package until Spain became member of the European Union in 1986. Most EU fleet, most EU fishermen are Spanish. Okay? EU fishing, EU, EU fisheries is Spanish. That, that is, 85% I think of EU fisheries fishermen are Spanish. It's extremely overcapacity in the Spanish fleet. In 1988, the EU paid for the first time money to the Moroccan government to allow the Spanish fleet fish in Western Sahara. It's an extre extremely big agreement. In 2006, there had been a pause for a couple of years, and then a controversial agreement came. The European Union would pay 36 million euros every year to the Moroccan government so that the Spanish fleet, mostly, could fish in waters which are not Moroccan. The questions were, why would you allow for such an agreement to take place? And the answer from the Commission is, we don't decide where the fisheries will take place. That's up to Morocco to define. So they, they did not at any point in the up, well, very little in the up until the decision was made in 2006-07, very seldom did they actually state that the fishes would be in Western Sahara. They would always say it's up to Morocco to define. Um, the, uh, the, tr the negotiator of the agreement, he called it the former Sahara. There is no problem. Western Sahara is part of Morocco. That was a negotiator of the 2007 to 2010 fisheries agreement. It's a Spanish. And then the issue was forwarded to the legal services of the European Parliament. And because there was no reference to Western Sahara at all in the uh, framework of the, the agreement, the part of the legal service, what would they say? Can they prejudge that it is in violation of national law? They could do that. They could, it's not in EU's position to enter into agreement in Western Sahara, but it was not mentioned anywhere, even, that it was in Western Sahara. So they would say, we have to look at it when, after the agreement has developed for a couple of years, if Morocco respects the prerequisites under international law. Um, whenever we brought up the issue of international law, they say, this is a matter of politics, politics is the United Nations, this is not a political agreement. Whenever we had discussions with parliamentarians in Brussels, they always say, don't come here with politics. This is a fisheries agreement. We deal with fish, not politics. That was a, is a constant. Okay, how much time do I have? 59, I have still some time. Okay, um, in, in, the coming year, in the following years, after the fisheries started, now this, this argument will proceed to, to see how the European Union admits this is most of all a political agreement. Uh, in, in the years following the start of the fisheries, we're now 2007, 2008, we had seven questions, not we, that's a strange thing to say, but the parliamentarians in Brussels posed seven questions to the Commission until the Commission actually admitted that fishing was, taped, was taking place in West Sahara. They did not want to document it, reveal it. So every time the question was, do you fish in West Sahara? The answer was, it's up to Morocco where the fisheries take place. So the question in the end was, how much catch is caught under the Food and Agriculture Organization's uh, geographical scope 34.1.1 or something, which is by, by chance something partially overlapping Western Sahara waters. And then we got the, re got the uh, clarification. But the European Union did not want to, to, to admit to this. Uh, the, uh, in 2011, there was a one-year extension. The agreement had been going on for four years. The fleet had been fishing in Western Sahara for four years. We, we heard no evidence at any point that any group, any Sahrawi group, had ever been contacted or listened to in terms of this fisheries agreement. Any letters sent to the Commission would be responded, this is a UN affair, or that there was no consultation or consent at any point. Um, so that was a, a, in 2011, a 12-month extension. What's very interesting is that the European Union, whenever they, a, a fisheries agreement is about to end, the Commission is obliged to seek an independent evaluation. 
Now, this evaluation on this agreement did not go into international law or human rights. It went into technical aspects of fisheries. It documented that this fisheries agreement was the least financially clever fisheries agreement ever signed. For every euro the European community, every euro taxpayers paid to Morocco, the European community got maximum 65 cents back. So it's a pure economic loss for the taxpayers. They could just as well be giving the money to the Spanish fishermen directly without, without asking them to fish. You know, it was a pure financial loss. This is in the, commission, in the evaluation. There are 11 stocks being caught under the license. Two of them, there are no data on the environmental sustainability. For the nine other stocks, they're all either overexploited or partially overexploited because of the European Union fisheries. This is extremely interesting for parliamentarians which care for the environment. It says it has no development effect, meaning it creates no local jobs. Now for us that's, uh, that has some international law and some political problematics, which kind of jobs would that mean actually on the ground, but there was no, no one really employed on the ground. They counted I think 150 people in total under the multi-million dollar euro agreement. Okay, so the evaluation slaughters all aspects of the technical part of the agreement. And then, in addition, we have the international law part. In December 2010, after fishing for four years, Morocco, for the first time, answers to a question from repeated questions. Year after year, the European Commission asks, how does this benefit the people on the ground? The European Commission refuses to listen to the wishes of the people, but they, they wanted to know the benefits of the population, meaning the Moroccans or the whatever people on the ground. What are the benefits? Morocco never provided the answer. In December 2010, Morocco provided a 44-page confidential PowerPoint presentation. Rustin, this document, this is the only reference to Western Sahara. It's a map and a name of a couple of ports. That's the only document. The Commission called it some documentation. We got some information, it was stated in an internal email. It's the only reference to any kind of local benefits. The evaluation, by the way, was written in French. It was secret, confidential. It is a several hundred page document. It's in a closed room. Parliamentarians can look at it and find out how the taxpayers' money is spent. If they leave their mobile phone, if they leave the computer, don't bring the assistant, they can go in and look at it with a pen and a paper, in French. That's, that's the parliamentary control over the taxpayer's money, right? So that caused a lot of friction also between the parliament and the commission. Why don't you share with us the information? It became really a power play between the institutions of the European Union. Anyway, there was then um, the parliament theatre. During the year of 2011, the budget committee in the parliament said, we don't want this agreement, it's not clever financially. Especially the Germans, they hated the thought that the German taxpayers' money were spent on nonsense, right? Uh, the environmental, uh, no sorry, the development committee, which are caring about international affairs and development issues, they had almost a unanimous, we don't want this agreement. And then it went to the fisheries committee. The fisheries committee's conclusion is normally sent, was always sent to the plenary for decision afterwards. So the fisheries committee has a lot of power. In the fisheries committee, you have the fisheries industry. So they are normally very positive to fisheries, no matter where and no matter how. The fisheries committee changed the conclusion. It, this is hilarious. Listen to this. The the uh, the fisheries the the the, the draft resolution text, which was supposed to be sent to the plenary, states this agreement is damaging for the environment. It is problematic in terms of Western Sahara, in terms of international law. It, it, it's, not, it's not very strict on that. It's very politically polite. It says it's problematic in terms of Western Sahara affairs or something. It says it's completely uneconomic. Therefore, we have to uh, we cannot accept the one-year prolongation of this fisheries agreement. Do you get that was the, that was the reasoning of the text. The plenary, the, plenary, no, the majority in the fisheries committee changed one word in the resolution, 
in the conclusion saying, therefore, we have to continue with the one-year fisheries. Isn't that absurd? So because it's destructive for the environment, for the economy, for the local jobs and international law, therefore, we have to continue fishing. Now, that very confusing document was sent to the plenary, the, all the seven, eight hundred parliamentarians, to vote. Okay, so do you all for or against such a bizarre statement? The counter-arguments in these days was, were spectacular. All the arguments in terms of finances, fisheries technical issues, environment, all of the normal arguments for a fisheries agreement had collapsed. There was nothing, there was no, no argument left for the, the fisheries industry, the fisheries lobby, especially the Spanish government, which is very much behind this, and the commission itself. So the only arguments they had left was the political arguments that we've been saying all the time, right? So the fisheries commissioner, the fisheries commissioner, imagine she would say this about Greenland agreement or something, or, or any other agreement, that this, we have to fish because of the Arab Spring. You know, it does make, it, 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 the, there was no fisheries technicality, that we have to fish it because Morocco is important to us. Uh, the Moroccan uh, government said at the bottom, political aspects of Western Sahara are not relevant. Um, Western Sahara is anyway part of Morocco. Many... Uh, the Fisheries Committee Vice President, if we reject it, we send a negative signal uh, to uh, the region, meaning perhaps Morocco, in a time where it's important to support democracy on Morocco. Is that what you need to fish in Western Sahara because you need to support the democracy process of Morocco? It's just nonsense, you know? And that was the... Uh, these are the political arguments we're talking about. It's all about supporting Morocco. It's not about fish. 296 parliamentarians voted for continued fisheries, even though it is damaging on all fronts. 40 of them are Italian. This is uh, December 2011. Try to ask, I can give you the names of those 40, try to ask them, can you give one reason, give you one reason why, why you voted for that agreement? There's, there's, well, anyway, 326 <laughs> voted against continued fisheries. This was the second time in European history that the parliament stopped a trade agreement. So it was a majority. It was a, a, a big issue. But this was then a combination of parliamentarians interested in international law, in West Sahara. There were about 180 of those who vote for West Sahara, for the Sahrawis, no matter what. But then in addition, there were a group of people voting on finances, the group interested in environmental issues. So it was a combination of, of aspects which led to the majority. Mm. Human Rights Day, uh, one year anniversary of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Twelve uh, Sahrawis were injured in the street of Layoun. Uh, they were protesting against the same day the European Parliament approved a new four-year fisheries agreement. This is two years afterwards. The fisheries commissioner's suggestion was we shouldn't fish in Western Sahara. Let's have an agreement with Morocco, but let's only fish in Morocco. And then the Spanish government was, of course, we, we need the fisheries in Western Sahara. We, we can't fish in Morocco only. Okay, so let's fish in Western Sahara. And then the request, so then we have to be clear on international law. Let's be clear on what aspects in Western Sahara are necessary to be fulfilled. And then that was taken away as well. The word Western Sahara was taken away. I'm finishing now in one minute. So the words Western Sahara were taken away also from this agreement. And the compromise was, okay, then let's have some very strong human rights clause in that text. A, a strong statement saying that if you violate human rights, we have to suspend it. Now that's kind of controversial, kind of strange, because the European Parliament, just a few weeks before, voted extremely strong statements saying Morocco violated human rights. So what is, it, what is that clause, what would it be worth if it was signed? So, two years of negotiations passed on that clause, and then in the middle of the summer break, the summer vacation, 2013, the agreement was inked with the Moroccan government, and the human rights clause was basically taken out. And all the institutions and the journalists were in holidays. So, nobody protested. Except the Sahrawis, of course. They have never been included at any point in these fishes talks. Okay. On Resource Watch, on our website, you find more uh, stuff on uh, on all aspects of the plunder. Uh, I'm putting outside uh, a report we've written on the oil industry, which is the main issue now. The oil industry, the phosphate industry, the Australian Federation of Phos Phosphate Importers. 
They all look to the European Union and they say, why can't we do the oil drilling or the phosphate importing when the European Union is fishing West Sahara? Yeah. So we are desperately uh, frustrated over the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. Che ha messo in evidenza anche molto bene le contraddizioni che ci sono in questi accordi, anche sotto altri profili, non sotto, soltanto quelli che abbiamo evocato prima, no? anche nel loro valore economico, della loro sostenibilità ambientale e tanti altri aspetti. Bene, ora invece ci poniamo la questione, dopo aver visto appunto questa faccenda delle risorse, se questi accordi per come sono formulati, per come sono costruiti, possano ritenersi in linea o in conformità con il diritto internazionale, in quanto tale. A rispondere a questa domanda abbiamo il professor Enrico Milano, il professor Enrico Milano è dell'Università di Verona ed è un esperto di questo specifico problema del diritto internazionale, cioè di esaminare la legalità ehm, negli accordi, nella cooperazione con paesi, con stati che controllano territori sotto occupazione illecita e quindi ha una visione molto dettagliata e molto approfondita su questo specifico tema. Non so se parlerà in inglese o in italiano, ma ti do comunque la parola. sentite? Eh, dunque innanzitutto ringrazio eh, Marco Balboni in generale gli organizzatori di questo, uh, di questo convegno, eh, è un'occasione più unica che rara di parlare di questi, uh, di questi problemi e affrontare questi problemi da diversi punti di vista. Eh, eh, Purtroppo uno dei miei limiti è che leggo le mail organizzative spesso un po' in, uh, non con adeguata attenzione, ragione per la quale ho, ho preparato la mia presentazione uh, in inglese, quindi questo renderà un po' il lavoro difficile per, uh, per, uh, per i traduttori, ma forse più semplice per gli altri uh, relatori. Eh, Marco Balboni quando ha introdotto il tema di questa eh, sessione eh, ha fatto notare come le prospettive siano prospettive diverse, eh, c'è la prospettiva più, più militante che abbiamo sentito appena adesso che è la prospettiva della società civile che ci è stata eh, ben esposta da Eric Hagen eh, C'è la prospettiva che Marco ha definito più neutrale dello studioso del diritto internazionale che affronta questi temi e c'è eh, la prospettiva eh, per esempio di un ex eh, capo dell'ufficio legale delle Nazioni Unite come Hans Corell e la prospettiva del, eh, di un eh, direttore se non intendo male del, degli affari giuridici del servizio, uh, del servizio giuridico del Parlamento uh, europeo. Ora, uh, chiaramente um, io rispetto a, questi ultimi, um, a queste due ultime prospettive ho meno vincoli perché sono uno studioso del, uh, del diritto internazionale e quindi non mi devo confrontare nella mia analisi con un diritto calato in un processo, in un processo politico. Eh, chiaramente noi studiosi del diritto internazionale, in particolare in Italia, siamo pagati molto poco ma abbiamo questo, questo vantaggio di poter essere più liberi in quello che, eh, in quello che diciamo. Eh, dicevamo, e diceva Marco, approccio neutrale. Sì, approccio neutrale e se penso a, a una diversità di metodi, di linguaggio con quello che è stato presentato molto bene da Eric Hagen, eh, questo non può, essere, non può che essere eh, confermato, ma eh, forse per, per la sorpresa di alcuni, eh, di alcuni di voi gli esiti e, e i risultati 
a cui, a cui giungo non sono molto diversi da quelli di Eric, uh, di Eric Hagen. Eh, passo uh, all'inglese, entro nel merito del, uh, della mia uh, trattazione. Now, um, I think the title of, that I, I gave to my presentation that I uh, communicated a, perhaps a bit too, too late to, to Marco um, is quite telling. Uh, the title is the 2013 fisheries protocol between Morocco and the European Union and the question mark is same old adage for Western Sahara? Question mark. And uh, the answer that I can anticipate is that it is yes, it is the same old adage for, for Western Sahara. Um, as you understand, the aim of my presentation today is that of briefly discussing the most controversial elements from the point of view of international law arising out the recent protocol that has been mentioned by Eric uh, Hagen that was concluded by the EU Morocco last year. Uh, needless to restate, the controversy relates uh, to the um, relationship between the protocol and some important principles of general international law such as uh, the principle of self-determination of peoples and the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural uh, resources. Let me say a few words about, um, about the protocol. Um, as Eric uh, Hagen has uh, mentioned, the protocol was approved by the European Parliament in December last year. Uh, it has entered into force uh, this year with Morocco's um, ratification. The protocol in itself uh, is a treaty instrument providing for the extension of the Fisheries Partnership Agreement concluded by DC and Morocco in 2006 and expired in 2011 due to the opposition of uh, the Parliament to uh, a previous draft uh, protocol. Under the current agreement, under the current deal, the EU is to pay uh, 30 million euros over a period of four years in order to obtain access to Morocco's fishing zones and to fund the development of Morocco's fishing sector. Plus 10 million euros um, to be paid in fees by European ship owners in order to get the fishing licenses uh, from the Moroccan authorities through um, the European delegation in, uh, um, in Rabat. Now, um, at first sight, as it has already been mentioned, the agreement um, is a typical uh, bilateral fisheries agreement involving a reciprocal relationship between the two parties. And yet, since 2006, uh, the string of agreements and protocols um, concluded by the two parties has proved controversial due to their actual extension to the waters off the coast of Western Sahara. To further underline that, I want to note that the latest protocol, approved last year, has been voted by the Council, but with a significant um, opposition and vote against by Sweden and Denmark, and with Finland, uh, Great Britain and the Netherlands abstain, abstaining. And the lack of support was due exactly to the concerns related to the agreement's compliance with international law and in particular with the rights of the Sahrawi, uh, Sahrawi people. The rejection by the European Parliament of the previous protocol in 2011 was also due to these concerns and there were also more environmental concerns and concerns related to the depletion of the fish stocks in the uh, Moroccan uh, fishing zones. Now, what I'm going to do today is to discuss three main legal issues that I think are uh, important, that are fundamental to understand and to answer and to address the questions of the compliance with international law or the latest protocol. The first one is, if you like, a preliminary legal issue that we must solve once for all, and that is the extension of the territorial, of the geographical scope of application of the agreement to the waters off the coast of Western Sahara. As it has already been mentioned many times, Western Sahara is most notable for its absence if one skims through the text of both the agreement and, uh, and, and the protocol. Now there is a part dedicated to a certain fishing zones within Morocco's fishing zone um, and the southernmost fishing zone is left undefined in its southern boundary and the northern boundary is uh, just um, 
a few kilometers north of the boundary between um, Western Sahara and, uh, and Morocco. In any case, a short distance, but to the north of, of the boundary. So that doesn't tell us uh, uh, anything. In a legal opinion rendered by the legal service of the European Parliament 2006, um, the legal office, after the, examining the text of the agreement, correctly, in my view, indicated that the partnership agreement neither included nor excluded the waters of the coast of Western Sahara. If we take the text of the agreement, I think that the most important provision we must look at is Article 2, Letter A of the agreement, which establish, establishes and gives a definition of what is Morocco's fishing zone. There is really a definition of Morocco's fishing zone. And um, the provision defines Morocco's fishing zones, and I quote, as the waters falling within the sovereignty or jurisdiction of the Kingdom of Morocco. End of quote. Whereas the notion of sovereignty, I believe, refers to a formal element clearly defined by international law rules, as I think we can certainly affirm that the waters of Western Sahara do not fall under the sovereignty of Morocco. And I think Morocco would be the only country to maintain this position uh, in, uh, in the world. Um, the notion of jurisdiction is much more ambiguous. Why? Because it is usually influenced by reference to a criterion of effective control or to ex the extension of, of specific rights such as those derived from attaching to the proclamation of an exclusive economic zone. A proclamation that Morocco, with regard to Western Sahara, has never, has never done. As we have heard, um, proposals aimed at inserting an exclusion clause in the agreement concerning Western Sahara were consistently defeated by the European Commission. And of course also by, uh, for Morocco, there were no starter for negotiations. And yet, if we look at the conclusion reached by the legal service of the Parliament in 2006, that is, that the agreement neither, neither includes nor excludes Western Sahara, I think that that conclusion does not hold true anymore. It is no more valid. Why? What matters most is that since 2009, it has become known, eventually, as Eric Hagen has shown, the data were released, it has become known that new vessels fish in the waters of Western Sahara, thanks to licenses granted under the agreement. Such practice has a clear meaning in international law, in my view. It is evidence of an agreement between the parties over the interpretation of this ambiguous notion of jurisdiction. And this is a clear interpretive criterion Subsequent practice is a clear interpretive criterion under Article 31, Paragraph 3, Letter B of the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaty. So there is an, a clear agreement over the interpretation of that notion of uh, jurisdiction. And that agreement includes the waters of the coast of Western Sahara. The 2013 protocol does not provide any elements pointing to a departure from the above interpretation. And we must conclude, in my view, that the current regime does extend to Western Sahara. This issue, in turn, raises two further legal issues that I'm going to address today. The first one is that of non-recognition of the duty of non-recognition of an unlawful situation a situation defined as unlawful by rules of international law. The continuing violation of the right to the Sahrawi people to self-determination, stemming from the continuing occupation, foreign occupation administration of the territory, triggers a number of obligations binding upon all members of the international community, including the duty of non-recognition of the legality of the situation, the duty not to render aid or assistance and the duty to cooperate to bring to an end the unlawful situation through lawful means. And this is an obligation that is not the fantasy of a professor of international law uh, working in his, uh, lonely working in his office. Uh, here I'm referring to the obligations enshrined in Article 41 
of the International Law Commission's Articles on State Responsibility and Article 42 of the ILC Articles on Responsibility of International Organizations, which were confirmed by the International Court of Justice in the World Advisor Opinion, an opinion also dealing with another violation of the principle of the right of self-determination, that time was the self-determination of the Palestinian people. Now, the obligation of non-recognition, I think, is particularly relevant to the conduct of the, the European Union vis-à-vis -vis Western Sahara. Why? Because the conclusion of an agreement or extension of an agreement may be considered an implied form of recognition of Morocco's legal authority over the territory. And clearly, implied forms of recognition come under the purview of the general obligation of non-recognition, as the SCJ has clearly stated in the Namibia Advisory Opinion, and the International Law Commission has reconfirmed in its more recent commentaries. From a more pragmatic perspective, certainly the lack of a resolution adopted by the Security Council reinforcing the duty um, of defectiveness or the duty of non-recognition by resorting to its implied powers under Article 25 of the Charter or even to its powers under Chapter 7 does not make the implementation of the obligation any easy in practice. We must be very honest and frank about this. And yet, uh, the obligation arises independently of such resolution. And this has been clearly stated in the World Advisory Opinion of the International Court of Justice and the ILC, uh, ILC commentaries. The second issue um, that is triggered by the extension of the agreement to Western Sahara. And this is uh, the issue that has been discussed more, most at length in, during this year in the debate over the compliance of these agreements with the international law. And it is uh, the, the, the weather and the conditions upon which natural resources may be exploited in all self governing territories. As we know, the Western Sahara is a non self governing territory. The discussion on this point has revolved around the legal opinion that, as we know, was rendered in 2002 by the UN Legal Office concerning the exploitation of natural resources in Western Sahara. And the opinion clearly established the natural resources of non self governing territories can be exploited. But that must occur, but must, pardon me, must not occur in this regard of the interests and wishes of the people of Western Sahara. That is an opinion that I understand will be discussed by, of course, by, by Dr. Corell, which I also understand was the drafter um, of, of the document, but correct if, if I'm wrong. And of course, I leave the authentic interpretation of that opinion to, uh, to, to him, even if I I suspect that his, uh, his, the authentic interpretation is not very different from my interpretation. Um, for the sake of brevity of today's presentation, I'm also not going to dwell upon the analogy between the legal regime uh, of um, administering power of non self governing territory provided under Chapter 11 of the Charter and imposing specific obligations upon the Euro administering powers and uh, the legal regime applicable to prolonged occupation of non self governing territories, as it is the case with, with Western Sahara. What I want to say this, is that even under a liberal interpretation that extends Chapter 11 obligations to the situation of, uh, of, Western, um, of Western Sahara, the opinion of the UN Legal Office in 2002 addressed the legality of concessions granted by the Moroccan authorities to private actors, not, I stress it, not on the capacity of Morocco to conclude international agreements on behalf of Western Sahara, even those concerning the exploitation of natural resources, not for that matter, on the legality of implied forms of recognition by third parties. Whether the foreign occupant and a third party like the European Union may legitimately enter into international agreements concerning the exploitation of natural resources in occupied territory is a question that, in my view, finds a negative answer, if only we apply the doctrine of non-recognition. For the sake of the argument, for the sake of really understanding the legal issues involved, even if we considered, even if we considered 
that this, a treaty instrument extending to the territory of Western Sahara may not necessarily run contrary, contrary to international law, it is to me well, very well established that exploitation of natural resources in all self governing territories requires both, and I stress both, a concrete benefit for the people and that exploitation is conducted in accordance with their wishes. And unfortunately, the latter, the latter term, that is that the wishes of the people are given due regard, has been systematically discounted in the practice of the European Union. With Sweden isolated in insisting that the views of the legitimate representative of Sarawis should be heard. The Sarawi representatives have consistently opposed the agreements, including the latest protocol, and such opposition has been recorded also in the latest um, report of the Secretary General on the situation of Western Sahara, which was issued in uh, April this year. Now, regardless of the controversial question as to whether the local population benefits from the agreements, with, I think, strong indicators um, pointing to the fact that the population does not benefit, uh, local population does not, and the Sahrawis do not benefit from the agreement. And regardless of, uh, um, and also with strong indicators that violations of human rights continue in, uh, um, in Western Sahara, the argument discounting the wishes of the people is openly contradicting my view um, rendered um, by the, the legal office in 2002 and by some kind of authentic interpretation that uh, well, will be probably given once more by Dr. Cora later but was already given in other speeches that he gave but it is also contradicted by consistent pattern general assembly resolution concerning uh, the exploitation of economic activities in all self governing territories. In sum, the international regime concerning the undertaking of economic activity, activities in all self governing territories envisages the population of the territory and their representatives not as mere spectators or at best the direct or indirect beneficiaries of the economic activities but as the ultimate holders of sovereign rights over the natural resources which have a vested and legally protected interest in being involved in the decision-making process and in the determination whether and how the resources should be used. Unfortunately, the new protocol does not contain any procedural mechanism providing for the involvement of the local population of the Sarawi representatives in the decision-making process or even in the supervision of its implementation. In my view, neither the referral at Article 1 of the Protocol to the Human Rights and Demo Dem uh, Democracy Conditionality Clause of Article 2 of the EU Moroccan Association Agreement, nor the strengthening of the joint EU Morocco mon monitoring mechanism are adequate in rendering the treaty regime in compliance with international law. In conclusion, uh, and I really come to my conclusion, I hope I have another two minutes. Yes? Um, especially to the extent that it enters into agreements concerning the exploitation of natural resources in all self governing territories, and it is institutionally involved in the implementation of the agreement, for instance, through the role of the, of the Commission's uh, uh, delegation um, um, in, in Rabat, which requires and obtain licenses, if I understand correctly, the process by, uh, by the Moroccan authorities. I think the EU institutions should be aware of the fact that international law obligations stemming from the principle of self-determination are also binding and incumbent upon the European Union. So not only upon Morocco as de facto or administering power of the region. And I think um, really that in this respect um, one cannot fail to notice the, the gap, the chasm between the EU's position concerning the fisheries um, agreements and the ambitious Article 2, Paragraph 5 of the Treaty of the European Union, by which uh, it is established that the Union, in its relations with the wider world, and um, I quote, 
shall contribute, if, I don't know whether it's the same provision that was mentioned earlier by, by Carlos Ruiz Miguel, I quote, shall contribute to solidarity and mutual respects among peoples, to the protection of human rights, to the strict, I underline strict, observance and development of international law, including respect for the principles of the UN, United Nations Charter. End of quote. And my last sentence is really um, as a, more, more than as a, as a scholar of international law, as a neutral observer, which does not come to neutral conclusion. But anyway, as, um, sorry, more or less. Um,